has done marvelous, he has done marvelous things. Praise the Lord, he has done marvelous, marvelous, he has marvelous, done marvelous things. Praise the Lord. Oh. services on today. We're so happy to see everybody who is here. If you are visiting with us, you are definitely our honored guest. Thank God for you. As we open up on today, we just want to consider one scripture. And that's Psalms 149, verse number one. It says, praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. So it's just a blessing for us to be here in this congregation on today. We want to remember those who are bereaved. We have many members who are bereaved at this time, in particular Brother Mendenhall, his entire family. We have those who are sick, afflicted. We want to remember them as well. But we also want to focus now on the opportunity to be here so let's thank God. Right. Father in heaven, we pause just to say thank you. We recognize that it is a privilege for us to be here on today. You've given us this opportunity, you've protected us, you've blessed us throughout the night, you've given us the zeal to want to be here to serve you and to sing praises unto you. So we just say thank you. We recognize, Father, that in this world of turmoil, city of turmoil, 
all the violence, all the issues that we have, Father, you are still blessing us. You continue, you have blessed us, and you continue to bless us. So we thank you, Father, to be here on today. Pray that it was those visiting with us and see something to us that is all about you, Father. They'll come to you before it's everlasting. We're so thankful, Father, for this opportunity. We pray that each person that stands before you are today in service, humble themselves and just give themselves to you. We just thank you for our membership, those that are here with us in person, those that may be joining us virtually, others that are our guests that are joining us virtually. We're just so thankful. We're so thankful for your son Christ that suffered and died and created this church, Father, giving us an avenue to one day be back with you. We pray not only for this congregation, but all the churches of Christ in the Chicago land area, all those in this country, all those throughout the world. Bless us and keep us, Father. Bless us and keep us. Please bless us and keep us. Yes, sir. Throughout this day and the remainder of our lives, we pray we ask you. Amen. Amen. Till she says, I surrender all to him, my freedom. I will never love and trust him. His presence. Let's go back to the beginning. All. All to Jesus. All to Jesus. I surrender all to Him, my friend. I gave him Oh, yeah. 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believed it, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God, revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Word of God for the people of God. The people of God say thanks be to God. I want to preach to you the next several moments using as a subject the motivation for our ministry. The motivation for our ministry. We find ourselves in Romans chapter number one, and here in chapter number one of Romans, we are situated in one of the most important letters in the New Testament. It could be the Roman book that, that can be seen as the centerpiece for the Apostle Paul to lay out the theology and lay out the direction of the church. It is this very book that through those throughout church history would agree that it shaped many spiritual lives. It is this book that gives us a motivation in how we ought to do ministry. Even more than that, it gives us a motivation in how we ought to live our lives. The largest motifs, the largest themes, the largest concepts in the book of Romans can be found right here in these four verses. These four verses serve as a centerpiece of the entire letter. For a little while, I want to unpack the motivation for our ministry. Here's the first principle out of the text. You know I'm a Bible preaching preacher. I've got to look at the text for all my inspiration and words. Text says that we are obligated to both the Greeks and the barbarians. Another translation puts it this way that we are in debt. So the first thing we see is the urgency of the gospel. The urgency of the gospel. If you're taking notes, we see the urgency of the gospel. That word obligated, that word debt literally means to owe something. And it can, in this case, it means that you owe something, something, uh, someone something that. You have not given to them before that you're trying to give something out of a non-restraint. That you are compelled to act. That word obligation of debt is the same thing that happens to you and I every single time you open up your mailbox. And in your mailbox you find a bill from a creditor. And that, that gave you a loan. And, and that debt that you owe means that you have an obligation. In like respect, Paul uses the same financial term and says, I am obligated to the gospel. He begins to unpack this in three ways. He says, first of all, I'm obligated to God. When Paul uses this concept of debt, what Paul is literally saying, he's saying, I owe it all to God. In other words, Paul is reflecting on where his help came from. He realized where his salvation came from. He recognized where his strength came from. He says, I'm obligated because it's what God did in me and for me that makes me want to share the gospel. Beloved, when you look at your life, you ought to be reminded that you are obligated to God to do ministry and to support those in ministry. When you consider all God has done in your life, when you consider the doors God has opened in your life, when you consider the times God went beyond your prayer, when you consider how God has kept your kids, when you consider how God has kept you when you were at the wrong place at the wrong time, when you consider how God protected you from worse that happened, one of the reasons why we share the gospel is because the good news of Jesus Christ is really unpacking everything that God has done in our lives. So not only are you obligated to God, you are obligated to your calling. Listen, when you read Romans, you cannot erase Paul's testimony. He brings it up in Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 1. And he brings it up again in Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 5. There, Paul refers to the fact that he, he is a preacher of the gospel. He is called to declare the gospel of Christ because of his testimony. Maybe you Bible readers remember his story. Acts chapter number 9. While on his way to persecute the church, a bright light comes and knocks him off of his horse. And there God reassigns him, takes him from destroying the church to now building the church. Now here Paul is doing the work of God and friends because there's a calling on his life. does not mean that there's not a calling on your life. There's a life that we have and we see in case in Romans with Paul's life, but your life can be read as a living epistle as well. If those in the room, those in the virtual vessel, you don't do the work that God has called you to do because it's convenient. 
You don't do that, that work because it seems like a good idea or a hobby. No, you do the work that God has for you because you have been called. The Bible says we are to be fishers of men. We are Christ's ambassadors. Are you going to some script for that lip? 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 20 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Friends, first we're obligated to God. Further, we're obligated to our calling. Not only that, we're obligated to the people. Here it is. He says, I am obligated. I am a debtor to the Greeks and to the non-Greeks. One version says, to the barbarians and the non-barbarians, to the wise and the unwise. Paul begins to outline the reason why we do what we do. Is that we do it for the people that God has called us to minister to. He begins to delineate two groups, the Greeks and those who are of other heritage. Those who were learned and those who were unlearned. Those who were scorned and those who were successful. Those who were in the plutocracy and those who were everyday common people. The working class and those even of little means. Those who don't even go to the, to the universities. Those who didn't sing uh, those songs in the, the, the universities and luxurious hills of Rome. He affirms that we aren't called to do ministry to one certain group of people. We weren't called to do ministry and share the gospel just to people whom we like and, and who we don't like. In essence, everyone needs the gospel. Yes, yes, you and I must understand that same thing. Everyone needs the gospel. The more that we do ministry, we can't be particular of who we do ministry to. Because the truth of the matter is, is that we all need the good news of God. The middle class needs the gospel. The rich need the gospel. The poor in spirit need the gospel. Each ethnicity, each race, each culture needs the gospel. Those in the hood need the gospel. Those in the suburbs need the gospel. Those in Lincoln Park need the gospel. Those in Garfield Park need the gospel. Those in Hyde Park need the gospel. We all need the gospel. The gospel does not discriminate because all of us need to know what God can do. That which we cannot do ourselves. Friends, if we're not careful, we'll be so sanctified that we miss who we're ministering to. Yeah. Friends, if we're not careful, we'll write people off. When you see that young man with tattoos as you drive on the street, if you, if you see that young woman with the, the nose piercing in your ear, you'll be careful not to turn up your nose at them because there'll be somebody that comes in your presence that doesn't smell like you, that doesn't dress like you, that doesn't look like you. And you got to understand that you can't deny them the gospel because when they're in the house of God, they all need the gospel. They all need the gospel. The young church man, the married young lady, the man with the suit and tie, the co-worker, the teenage mother, those who are in school, the physician in the hospital, every single one of us needs the gospel. Yeah, the gospel doesn't discriminate because the ground is leveled at the foot of the cross. I wish I had somebody. I wish I had a church. We, we all need it. Literally, what Paul is saying is this. He's saying that if you and I are going to do well in this season of time, and in the context that God has placed us in, we have to ask God to give us a burden for people. Yeah, yeah. Lord, allow me to feel the beautiful souls of people that are lost. Yeah, whether it's in my neighborhood, whether it's in my workplace, among my circle of friends and associates, or in my extended family, among those who I mentor. God, let me see people the way you see people. Yeah. Let me love people the way you love people. Yeah. I'm obligated. But specifically in the text, he's also obligated to believers. So many times, many of us overlook verse number 15. It says, I am eager to preach the gospel to those of you who are in Rome. Watch this now. Uh, he's writing the letter to Christians, but he says, I want to preach the gospel to Christians. Yeah. Wait, wait a minute. I thought we just needed the gospel to get saved. And once we get saved, we're good. We, but Paul seems to suggest that the gospel is not just good enough to get you in. He seems to suggest that the gospel is enough to keep you in your walk with God. The gospel is not just enough to say that you made it in. The gospel will keep you every single day of your life until you get to your heavenly home. And he says, I came to preach to those who have faith too. You know, we appreciate the message of God. Much better when we consider the bad news. Yeah. God created mankind in his image and likeness. Mankind sinned against God in the Garden of Eden. And even now in our era, 
We know that we have sinned as well. God, knowing that we need a divine remedy, sent his son, Jesus Christ, the incarnate word, to die on the cross, the sins of humankind. He was crucified. He said he was crucified. Placed in a broad tomb because he only deemed three days was necessary for him to pro proclaim a prophetic validity. He, he, he knew that uh, he would not be there long, but I wouldn't be a preacher if I left him there. I gotta tell you what happened. I gotta tell you some news. On, some good news. That Jesus rose from the grave according to the scriptures. And after a little while, he ascended on high and is coming back to those who are going to be ushered into their heavenly home. And because he got up, we can now have a relationship with God. Because of his work, we can be reconciled back to God. That's good news. And it's enough to do the heavy lifting to make salvation possible. But it's also what maintains your walk with the Lord. You read the gospel when you mess up. You read the gospel when it's all good. When you begin to believe you can't get it back together again. You got to remind yourself of what Jesus Christ did on that cross. That gives you hope when you mess up. Beloved, we will mess up in our lives. We will sin in our lives. And when we sin, we don't fall down, never get back up again like it's the end of the world. But no, we repent and run to the cross where it is hope. The gospel gives us hope in the midst of hopelessness. The reason why we need the gospel is that you and I will face difficult times in our lives. We'll face some hard times in our lives. You got to remember that gospel, that, that, the, that the gospel is powerful, that Jesus died on a Friday evening, but, but he got up on Sunday morning. Which means whenever I face a dead situation, whenever I face a dead marriage, whenever I face a dead career, whenever I face a dead family situation, whenever I face a dead financial situation, guess what? I've got some hope because when Jesus got up, i got some hope for whatever comes in life. And so what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to show us that as he's preparing to go to Rome to preach the gospel to Christians, he needs Christians to understand that we all need the gospel. Not only is there urgency to the gospel, Second note, secondly, there is a boldness to the gospel. Firstly, there is an urgency of the gospel. Secondly, there is a boldness to the gospel. Not only does he say, I'm eager to declare God's word, not only do I have the energy for it, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the boldness of the gospel. Paul, why are you saying I'm not, I'm, I'm not ashamed? The reason why he says I'm not ashamed is because the gospel was not trendy back then. It was not popular back then. It was not on the Discover page back then. It wasn't a hashtag back then. It was, it was beneath them. And they didn't like the gospel. Why? Because they didn't want to hear that they were sinners. They didn't want to hear that their works could not save them. They couldn't hear that they were good enough by their own might and power. They didn't want to hear that they were lost and dead in their sins. They didn't want to hear that because it was offensive to them. Yeah. They want a Savior who went to the cross. They want a Savior who will come in uh, to, to, to save them and deliver them from themselves and themselves and their sins. They want a Savior on a white horse to deliver them from their enemies. They wanted someone to give them military victory. They didn't want a gospel that was open to all people. They wanted a gospel that was open to a select group of people. So they were offended by the gospel. Paul says, listen, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In essence, he says, I know it may offend you, but, but I'm not ashamed. Uh, Matter of fact, they were so offended that when Paul would enter many cities, they would hear him preach, they would beat him and persecute him, and many times they would run him out of the city. Yeah. Beloved, it may have been that way 2,000 years ago, but in 2021, the Bible is not that far from where it is in this text. Right. You begin to talk about the gospel, and many people get offended. About the gospel. You, nobody wants to hear that there's only one way to get reconciled back to God. But like Paul, you and I cannot be ashamed because people want to say today, I can live my life any kind of way. I can, I can have a Burger King religion where I can have it my way. But, but this text reveals that Paul does not give up on the gospel. Paul doesn't say, Paul doesn't say you gotta go with the latest fad and the latest trends to keep up with the gospel. That's he said, don't be surprised when the gospel's not popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't be surprised when you lose some friends of your decision to follow God. Yeah. Don't be surprised when you when you have people who don't want to hang with you anymore. The gospel yeah. is yeah. divine truth. Yeah. God wasn't trying to win any popularity contest. No, God was trying to give people salvation. Yeah. There's only one way to get to God in that through. 
Christ Jesus. Yeah. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of it. I'm bold in the gospel. Yeah. Why are you bold, Paul? Paul says in the text, the power of God that brings salvation. He says, you want to know why I'm not ashamed? Because salvation is about the power of God. He says, this salvation is not about my power. It's not about me trying to fit God into a neat little box. It's not about me trying to fit God into a religion that I believe makes me look good. No, he says, this salvation, this is about not your power, not my power, not our power, but it's about the power of God. The word power in the Greek, the word dunamis. We get our English word dynamite. It is that type of life altering power. See, it was the power of God that created the universe. It was the power of God to send his son through 42 generations to fulfill a prophetic vocation. It was the power of God that allowed a virgin to conceive to a bouncing baby boy. It, it was the power of God that allowed Jesus to live a, live a sinless life. It was the power of God that allowed him to die on the cross for our sins. It was the power of God to send an angel to sit on that temporary gravestone after an earthquake caused it to roll away. It was the power of God to offer salvation and forgiveness to all mankind. The gospel is about the power of God. That's at work in our lives. The text says, it's at work to produce salvation. It says, understand the power of God works for salvation. In February of this year, we had a terrible ice storm in the city. Many people were stranded. Matter of fact, the storms came right around the new day hour. Many people were trapped at work trying to make it out. Some couldn't even make their way home. The news story covered one story where a particular police car was trying to rescue someone, and the police car even got trapped in the ice. Just so happened there was a group of motorists that were driving what they called the Lakefront Trail Jeep Club. Those Jeeps were especially equipped to handle this wintry weather. They had these nice, thick, wide tires, and they had four-wheel drive. So while others were getting stuck, this club of Jeep trucks would go in and rescue people. Matter of fact, they would go and pull that police cruiser out of that ditch. Matter of fact, those same chiefs would connect and hook up with the 18-wheeler that was stuck in the, the middle of the road. And they would pull that 18-wheeler back into the right side of the road. These vehicles were specially equipped to rescue in wintry weather. Yes, sir. Friends, yes, sir. when you and I were stuck on the side of the road, yes, in our sinful condition, yes, the God of heaven sent someone who was especially equipped because he was fully God and he was fully man. And he was equipped because he had never sinned in his life. And he reached down and rescued us. And he pulled us out of our sinful condition. Friends, you and I need to know that the gospel is powerful. Why? Because this is what the gospel does. It rescues us. It saves us. It delivers us. It pulls us out of our sin to give us another chance. Oh, yes, he has. He gave you another chance. I know he's delivered you. I know he's rescued you. He says that he's given you a power in the gospel. He says there's a boldness to the gospel because it's the power of God that is at work for the salvation of those who will respond to it. Watch it now. It gets gooder and gooder and better and better. Not only is there a boldness to the gospel, there's an urgency to the gospel, but finally there is a believing of the gospel. I'm taking notes, firstly, there's an urgency of the gospel. Secondly, there is a boldness to the gospel. Lastly, further, there is a believing to and of the gospel. Yes, yes. It says it like this in verse number 17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Verses number 16 and 17 presents the case for the gospel. Paul says, this is why I do what I do. For believers, this has to be our motivation for ministry. This phrase, the righteousness of God, unpacks two things. I wish I had time. On one side, uh, the, the righteousness of God speaks to the activity that God did to rescue us. That God sent his son and went after us to redeem and bring us into right relationship with him. On the other side of the spectrum, 
Righteousness also refers to the fact that we are made righteous, not because we do the right things, not because we say all the right words, not because we do all the right thinking, but no, Jesus Christ is righteous, and because he is righteous, we inherit his virtue when we give our lives to God and declare a him to be our Lord and Savior. It's him that makes us look good, and no other thing of no other way will work. Amen. Because of how Jesus has worked in our lives. Yeah. Then he shows us this gospel cannot be activated unless it receives the right response. Right. 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 So you can know the truth, but unless you respond to the truth, Hallelujah. you miss out on what God wants to do in your life. Yeah. The scripture reveals that you need to believe, receive, and respond to the gospel. Yeah. The text says it can be accessed by faith. Everyone believes in something. If you choose to respond to God, you have to have your faith in the right place. Yeah. To follow through on the divine commandment of Jesus. Yeah. That we must become disciples, being baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Hallelujah. Spirit. For the forgiveness of sins, being placed on his path to obey everything that he has commanded us. Yeah. When you use your faith to confess God as Lord and Savior, you act on that by being baptized. And that same faith will sustain you. Hallelujah. As you continue to know. That is from first to last. Somebody once said, a faith that fizzles before the finish had a fatal flaw at the first. A faith that fizzles before the finish had a fatal flaw at the first. That's to say, in other words, if your faith does not endure, if your faith does not make it, that means you had your faith in the wrong place. You need to guard and keep your faith in Christ Jesus. Because you got your faith in the preacher. You're going to lose your faith. If you have your faith in the song leaders, you're going to lose your faith. If you have your faith in your parents, you will lose your faith. I wish I was talking to somebody that that is not perfect, but God is perfect. So we depend on the Lord. Got to trust in Him. Got to lean on Him. Got to depend on Him. Got to look to Him. Got to follow Him. Because there's no other way to please Him but by faith. You use faith all the time, friends. When you came to this church building, you sat on that pew. You didn't check to see if the screws were in. You didn't check to see if that thing was going to hold you up. You just believed that it will. You just believed that it was going to be all right. When you dropped your kids off at school and you picked them up after school, you have enough faith, Brother Hampton, to believe that they're going to be there when you get done. When you drive down the highway and you try to stay in your lane, Brother Coleman, you got to have some faith that the other one is going to stay in their lane, too. You use faith all the time, friends. And there's nothing better than putting your faith in God. Sometimes you got to remind yourself of how sweet it is to put your faith in God. A God that will sustain you. A God that will fight your battles. A God that will calm your fears and wipe away your tears. No wonder why the Apostle Peter exhorted the believers to say, make every effort to add to your faith. Goodness, knowledge, self-control. It's not enough for you to just believe. you got to grow in your faith. Your knowledge has to be mature. And that's discipleship. I wish I could tell you that Paul's life was full of good times. But Paul is pinning this letter from a prison cell. As he's trying to make his way to Rome. Which means you can be in a tight situation. And that doesn't mean God has forgotten about you. You you can be in a tight situation. And that does not mean that God has given up on you. Uh, That means you probably are headed in the right direction. When you suffer for Christ's sake. Because trouble will find your faith and have it in the right place. Because just like the psalm says, if you have your faith in the wrong place, it will be shaky ground. you got to have your faith in the right place. And I'll stop by here today, beloved, so that you know that this is the motivation for our ministry. This is the reason why we live. This is the reason why we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. What got you up this morning? It was the gospel. What kept you on your way? It was the gospel. What brought you here this morning? It it was the gospel. What keeps you going when life gets hard? It it is the gospel. What is that fire shut up in your bones? It it is the gospel. It is the gospel that causes you to be concerned about others. Because if you know the gospel can change us, you would not know that it can change other people. It can change your coworker, it can change your neighbor, it can change your niece, it can change your nephew. And every single time we get a chance, you ought to tell somebody 
I'm Christ. Well, I tell him just like that. that I, was, I was tore up from the floor. Him. I was just like that. And, and I still had some issues, matter of fact. But, but God is working on me. The grace of God is covering me and adding to my faith. And it's getting better and better every single day with Jesus. Every single day, I'm trying to get this thing right. Every single day, he's helping my mind to stay on the right track. And my attitude to get right. And my words to get right. Somebody ought to tell them about Jesus. A young boy went to his pastor and said, Pastor, Pastor, why do you keep on telling that same old story? Every time you preach, every time you preach, you, you said that he died on a Friday, they buried him in a tomb, and he stayed there Friday night and, and Saturday night, but Sunday morning he got up. And the young boy said, I just don't get it, Pastor. Why do you keep on telling that same old story? Well, he said, young man, when you go to a basketball game, well, they try to get that same old ball in that same old net. Why is that? Young man, when you go to a baseball game, why do they keep on trying to get that same little white ball over the fence? Why is it when you go to a hockey game, they try to get that same old puck in that same old net? He said, why is it when you go to a football game, they try to get that same old ball on the lines of the end zone. The little boy said, well, that's how we win. And the pastor said, that's why I'm telling you that he died on Friday, that he was buried on Sunday, that he rose Sunday morning with all power in his hands. He said, young man, that's how we win. And beloved, that's the truth of the gospel. That's how you win in life. That's how you please God. That's how you have to do it. You have to look to him who is the author and the finisher of your faith. Who is the source? Who is he and what's his name? His name is Jesus. Mary's baby. His name is Jesus. Emmanuel. His name is Jesus. The Prince of Peace. His name is Jesus. Wonderful Counselor. His name is Jesus. Mighty God. His name is Jesus. King of Kings. His name is Jesus. Lord of Lords. His name is Jesus. The Good Shepherd. His name is Jesus. The Way, the Truth, and the Life. His name is Jesus. The Lily of the Valley. His name is Jesus, the bright morning star. His name is Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega. His name is Jesus, the beginning and the end. His name is Jesus. What's his name? Somebody ought to shout Jesus. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise his name. That's the motivation for our ministry. That's the reason why you get up every morning. Because you know that when you are placed in a situation where people, the world, and your enemies have written you off, the story has just begun. Because God is a God of resurrection. God is a God of revival. Here it is. If you've lost anything, God can revive that within you and give you double for your trouble. Serve God. Mighty good God. We ought not be the best kept secret. What God can do. We've got to declare in the name of Jesus. With urgency. With boldness. Here it is. Believing. That it will transform the trajectory of your life. And others' lives. James said if you believe. The wavering faith. Will never accomplish anything. Paraphrase. And that's the message translation version. Saying if you believe and you doubt. You might as well not even pray. Amen. You pray for God to open up doors, preach, share the light of Jesus in the world. You've got to believe yes. it's powerful to change the world. Hallelujah. Change you. Change us. Stand to your feet all over the building. That's the offer the invitation of God. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must not be ashamed to give God our lives, even amongst the sanctuary, even in public. How would it look if you were married and you didn't wear your ring in public? How would it look if you not went out with your, your wife or your girlfriend on a date you didn't acknowledge them when they called for it? How, how would they feel? But the same is true 
God. And God says you don't want to testify of his goodness in public. Talk about it. But you want to keep it a secret in private. Amen. Amen. It's the same effect. Okay, God is calling us to be people who are bold, they yes. have our own faith. To declare the wonderful works of him who has rescued us and transferred us to marvelous light. Um, We're gonna be praying in a moment. I want those who are this time having a prayer request to be standing. Those who don't have a prayer request at this time, be seated. Yeah. We have our deacons. If we have our deacons, if we have our ministers, we can get those cards from them if they have a prayer request. We can navigate that at this time. And if you have a prayer request, you can navigate that to the office during the week. Those of you who do have a prayer request, I want to pray for you right now. As we bow and eyes, we close. We stand to our feet in the presence of God. Father God, we're thankful to you. Your faithfulness and your goodness. You, You've shown us time and time again. We once more thank you for your presence and power in our lives. We come today, Lord, just thankful. Thankful and overwhelmed that you keep on blessing us. Hallelujah. We know that we don't deserve it. Lord, we praise and honor your name, but God, right now, as your people gather together, not only bring glory to you, but we ask of you something, yeah. that you will heal, that you will transform lives, yeah. that you will calm our fears and anxieties and wipe away our tears, Hallelujah. that you will give us a support system, that you will help those who are struggling with their ailments. Yeah. God, help us to be the hands and feet of you to do work in ministry while we wait on the change to come. Yeah. God, as we're running to see what the end is going to be, trust in you and believe in you yeah. for everything that you will give us and more. Because we know you can go beyond and above what we can ask or even conceive. Yes. God, right now, someone's hurting. Someone has some burdens in their heart. Someone needs more boldness in their witness. Yes. God, I ask that you do something for them that only comes from you. Hallelujah. And at the end of the day, we can say that no one gets the glory Hallelujah. but you. Hallelujah. Because we didn't have it in us in the first place. You. That you deposited it in our lives. Yes. God, this we pray more in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, church family. We've come to the communion portion of our service. In Matthew 26, verse 26, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and break it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit, of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us go in prayer. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we just thank you for all the many blessings and the daily bread you give to us. At this time, we just recognize the bread, bread that symbolizes your body broken for us so we may have life and life everlasting. And this cup, which symbolizes your blood, blood shed for us that our many sins may be forgiven. We do this in remembrance of ye. Now at this time, you may take your communion. God bless. Good morning, everyone. We have now come to the portion of our service which is set aside for us to be able to give back to the church. God uses our giving as an investment where everyone gets a return. If we are blessed beyond our needs, it is not for the purpose of living more lavishly, but instead it is used for to be able to give back to others. So as God continues to bless us, let us continue to remember to give back to him and to give back to those and bless those who are in need. In Malachi 3, verse 10, 
It reads, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now where herewith, said the Lord of hosts, if I would not open you the windows of heaven and pour out you out a blessing, that there shall be not room enough to receive it. At Sheldon Heights, we offer three ways that you may give back to the Lord. One, you may use our electronic giving, which is called Give Plus. Secondly, you may drop off at the annex to one of the administrators who would be present there. And thirdly, you may mail your contribution to 11355 South Halsted. Let us go to our Father in prayer at this time. Our Father and God, we want to thank you for all you have done for us at this time. Father, we want to thank you for keeping us safe and allowing us to be, see another day in this world. Father, we want to continue to ask you to bless those who are in need and ask us and remind us that it is our responsibility to support them and most of all to support you. These blessings and many more we ask in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.